So uh, I'm going to talk about technology, about DevOps, and stuff like that. Or I thought, you know, I thought I was going to do that, but then I figured, yeah, I don't really know about any of that shit. I'm going to talk about a thing I do know, uh, which is, you know, I don't really belong anywhere. I think. Um, took me a while to uh, to get used to that or to even uh, discover that. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just do a talk about that. Uh, by the way, this is me uh, about a week after I made CTO of my previous company, where my management said, uh, Yup, uh, you're a CTO now, right? Can you just you know, lay out the future for the next three to five years, please? Thank you. So I tried. Uh, didn't really work out because I haven't really had the time to prepare anything. You know, I was CTO for a couple of weeks. Um, and that's kind of the story of my life. I've never really known what I've been doing, still don't. Um, Really weird for me to be on stage here talking about something I don't know about, but we'll see how it goes, right? So my name is Joop. Uh, I've been a total fraud since about 2005, which is when I started working. Um, and so the, on the left, you have me in a mohawk. Uh, that's an actual mohawk that people drew from me on uh, in 2006. So on the right, that's actually me with the mohawk uh, because I used to work at a school with a barber shop. And the people at the barber shop were always looking for people to, you know, butcher their hair. Uh, I mean, practice. Um, and so I went up there every month or so, and I got a mohawk, red hair, black hair, pink hair. I've had all of the colors. Um, the reason I show this picture is because I was working for about nine months when this picture was taken. And the reason I'm up, uh, up on a stage there is because, you know, I, I used to do university. I, I tried being you know, a responsible adult do the university thing. Didn't really work out, so I, I took a part-time job somewhere, and I figured, yeah, okay, I'll just work for a while, and then I'll figure out what I want to do next. You know, I'll, I'll be in university again next year, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I thought, well, let's just do a bunch of training courses to figure out what I like. So I did all of the training courses, about 30 of them. And, th and so my, uh, my boss said, well, you, why the, why the F are you doing all these training courses? Don't you know what you want to do? No, I don't. But why do you work here? Well, I like beer and I like the people. I kind of like IT, so I don't know. Let's try that. And so they asked me to kind of give my life story of nine months um, up on a stage for about three, 400 people talking about why I did have, have that red hair, uh, talking about why I did all those training courses. And that, you know, that talk kind of set me off on a stage and on a path where for 15 years, I still didn't really know what I was doing. I was stumbling along, doing new things. But you know, every year I thought, well, uh, I, don't, I still don't really know what I sh should be doing or what I'm supposed to be doing or if I'm even good at it. Uh, and that kind of continued my, my whole professional career. I'm, I'm kind of like the, the third one from, uh, from the left. If you haven't noticed, it's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of how I feel for most of the time. You know, hoping, praying, yeah, they'll not notice me, you know, it'll be fine, they'll, they won't discover me. Um, you know, I, and at the same time, people were saying to me, you're, you're an okay CTO or an okay technical engineer or, you know, an okay architect because I did this VMware thing, VMware Certified Design Expert, which is kind of exclusive, it's only 200 people in the world, you have to submit a paper, defend it in real life. Um, and so I wrote, I don't know, 150 pages of bullshit I thought. <laughs> um, it wasn't, apparently, because I made VCDX. I, uh, I graduated from that. I'm number 101, which coincidentally doesn't help because 101 means, you know, <laughs> beginner level. Um, and it kind of continued, right? So I did a thing called The Cube, which is at big trade shows. You go and interview all of the important people at the trade show, live streamed, you know, tens of thousands of people uh, watch that. Uh, I do a thing called Tech Field Day where I travel to the US and I get to interview Silicon Valley startups about the things they're doing. And every time I do a cool thing like that, I kind of say to me, yeah, why the F does that happen to me all the time? So I'm you know, fooling myself continuously. It's like I do a good thing and then, yeah, it, you know, it happened, it's coincidence, or you know, I didn't really take part in it, or uh, it wasn't my doing. And so that's kind of weird. Uh, and not everything goes smoothly, right? This is my rejection email from a, a talk I submitted to um, uh, Cloud Native Con. And so I got this email, sorry, you're not accepted, blah, blah, blah. And then one minute later, I got another one. And then one minute later, I got another one. 
So that's not really the ideal way to let down an imposter. Uh, that took me a couple of beers to get over, to be honest. But along the way, you know, I kind of discovered that I'm not alone in this feeling, right? The feeling that I kind of stumble along, um, that I'm not really worthy, I'm not really good at shit. Um, because this is a good pie chart of probably this room, and we'll, we'll do an exercise in a couple of minutes, where, you know, I think everybody feels like an imposter at some point. I do continuously because, A, I don't really like work, and B, you know, I self-doubt myself sometimes. Uh, but there's people who are very explicit in this, like me. Uh, I'm on stage telling about my imposter syndrome, so the assumption is I kind of do have it. Uh, on the other hand, there's, you know, people that get imposter syndrome as well, or, but aren't vocal about it, or haven't discovered it yet. And then there's everybody else who also has imposter syndrome at some point, in some way, in some form. So I'm not alone, which comforts me to be standing here on stage because I see, you know, my peers, uh, you all are shit too. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's, that's the worst joke I have. Um, and the funny thing is, you know, other people have been explicit about this as well. So this is a guy called Mike. I don't know if you could know this guy called Mike. He built a small company called Atlassian. <laughs> Nobody knows that, right? And so this guy was on stage at a TED conference a couple of years ago. I think it was in, in Australian. Uh, he, he is an Australian too. And this guy is super successful. He built one of the biggest DevOps companies around, right? Uh, you know, and he's on stage telling about his imposter syndrome. And he had this funny story where he told uh, the audience where uh, he started his company out of a garage like all good startups do. And then at some point the company got bigger and bigger and bigger and they needed to hire an HR person. And so he's interviewing a potential HR person and he's sitting there and he, he's thinking to himself, yeah, but I've never actually worked in a company with an HR person. How do I know if this person is good or not? So successful company, you know, uh, insanely big by, by these standards uh, these days. But back then, even then, this guy was doubting himself when he had to hire that HR person. This is, by the way, also the guy that tweeted at Elon Musk at some point saying, hey, Elon, can you build us a gigantic battery in Australia? Because a part of Australia where he lives has massive power issues. Um, and then he, uh, and Elon said, yeah, okay, we can build this thing within 100 days with a certain capacity. And if we fill out that, you'll get the battery for free. And so suddenly this guy, an imposter, seriously self-doubting himself, was called a solar expert by the rest of the world. He had to go, you know, on dozens of news stations explaining, you know, all kinds of different things about the solar power crisis or the electricity crisis in Australia. And so this guy was si sitting there, yeah, I don't know any anything about electricity, about power grids, about anything. But now I'm on, you know, CNN giving an interview about this stuff because he tweeted at Elon Musk, which I think is a funny story because, you know, if you look at him, uh, he, uh, he doesn't really come across as a solar power expert or anything. So I want to do an exercise. I just said I, I would do, I'm going to do it. Here's how this works. If you recognize yourself in the phrase up on the screen, raise your hand and please keep it raised. So once you raise it, don't do it back down, right? Do you tend to chalk up your accomplishments to luck or timing? Well, I do. Do you hate making mistakes, being less than fully prepared or not doing things perfectly. Keep them up if you agree with this one or the previous ones. Do you fear feedback? Are you crushed by even constructive criticism? Right, keep them up if, if you answered yes to one of those. Um, do you live in fear of being found out, discovered, or fired? Right, keep them up. So, welcome to the club, right? Um, remember that pie chart? This is another way of confirming that you all have imposter syndrome too. Um, there's been you know, a bunch of research that, that goes all over the place, but most research comes, you know, comes out at about 70% of people actually experience this in one way or another. I won't go into the research, I'm not good enough to do that. But what is imposter syndrome? What is it that I experience, right? It is my internal measuring stick is broken. You can read the, the proper explanation, by the way. But I just explain it as you know, your internal ruling stick to measure yourself is broken. Mine went broken by, because of beer and alcohol, by the way. 
Another way to put it is pluralistic ignorance, where you, know, you're, you doubt yourself privately, but you don't talk about it, and one, some other uh, guy or girl does that too, privately, and nobody talks about it. So everybody's feeling the same thing. That's kind of like the emperor's clothes, if you know that thing from, from back in the day. Um, but no one voices it, so no one really knows about the other person. They have it as well. And in IT, this problem kind of becomes worse. Because you know, how many people have heard about best practices in IT, right? <laughs> There's one thing to do things, one way. Yeah, no, everybody has their own best practice. And so it's really hard to know if the way you are doing things is a good way, the right way, or just shit. Nobody knows, right? You can do things in so many different ways, it's impossible for you to know if the thing you do is actually the right way. And so that creates a lot of discussion, that creates a lot of um, insecurity with people because they don't know. There's another way to say that, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, I like being at the peak of Mount Stupid. I was a couple of times I was there. So I started out my career doing novel things, if you remember, network and shit like that. Group, group wise, e-directory, uh, really cool uh, technology back in the day. Then I did VMware, then I did storage, now I do a thing called DevOps, I think. Please say yes. <laughs> but in IT, that goalpost keeps moving, right? So I started out with Novell, and then the goalpost moved because Novell was no longer the thing you did. You did something else. You did, I don't know, Microsoft, or you did virtualization or storage or whatever it was. So every couple of years, the whole technology landscape changes. So you have to learn a whole bunch of new things again. And that doesn't really help if you have to go from I know nothing to I know everything, but in reality you don't, and then you go back down to yeah, I, I know I don't know anything, and then you go, oh, okay, I know, I know shit. And that happens over and over, like every, I don't know, four years, five years, whatever it is. <laughs> but if you kind of zoom out, you know, you can't see the struggle. So when I was doing Novell, I was on the top of the world, and then, you know, I learned a new thing. But while I was new and, uh, learning a new thing, I never really said to anyone, you know, I'm crap at this new thing because it's new to me and I haven't learned it yet. So it's all a matter of perspective, i.e., um, if I don't talk about the, the fact that I'm insecure about knowing new shit or learning new shit, then it's kind of hard to actually discuss it. So I keep, you know, going back and forth in my head. Um, and I like this picture because, it, you know, if you zoom out enough, if you ignore most of the, the signals, if you don't talk about it, yeah, it's gonna be, you know, you are here and nobody can see your struggle. So you have to do something about it, but we'll come back to that later. And so this is a thing called NLP. Again, I'm not gonna you know, try to even explain what it is other than that you are crap filter in your head. So I, I have one in my head. I have a you are crap filter going on continuously. So while I'm doing this talk, I have thought about 30 times already, oh, you're a crap, you, you suck. Um, doesn't help that I am slightly hungover, by the way. I blame the beers, but the beer, were, the beer is better than last year. Uh, less alcohol. But basically, NLP says something along the lines of um, information comes in, you have a filter in front of all your senses, you process it through those filters, and that makes you think in a certain way. You have convictions, you have beliefs, those are created by the UR crap filters or whatever filters you have. Which means that you know, you've, you've learned this along the way. You've bumped your head, you've, uh, you've learned to not talk about it, you've learned to keep it within yourself. Uh, so it's really hard to talk about. And so what do you do to kind of fix this whole thing? There's a couple of ways uh, to do it. And I'm gonna start small, like things you can do today, and then I'll end with like the end boss of, of the, you know, the 80s games where you have to defeat the big guy. And so the easiest one is to do this. Every day, like a mantra in front of the mirror. We can practice this, by the way. Who wants to practice? <laughs> you know, the high-pitched voice. So but a mantra, uh, good or bad, you know, it, it does help. Saying to yourself, you know, every time you say something negative about yourself or you think something negative, say two things that are positive about yourself. It is as easy as that. You'll retrain your filters, the NLP filters, 
And because, you know, at some point, the negative stuff diminishes and the positive stuff will stick, you'll remember it. So I would recommend that you try this, actually doing this in front of a mirror. Uh, make a selfie or a recording, send it to me, because I like to laugh too. <laughs> There's one more. You can, um, you can also um, kind of conclude that you shouldn't compare yourself to anyone else, especially not people on the internet. Who's on the internet? Who's been in a <laughs> discussion, right? People on the internet are the worst. So don't compare yourself, right? Try not to. It's hard. You'll do it anyway. Uh, but it's kind of easy to at least try to not compare yourself to anyone else. And then you could do this, where I've made a copy-paste error. Stupid me, right? See? But uh, all compliments you receive, right? So the thing you could do is try to practice with compliments. And again, we'll, we're going to try that in a minute. But basically, Giving a compliment is one of the hardest things to do. Receiving a compliment in a proper way is even more impossible. So what we'll do is we'll practice here in this room. So team up with the buddy beside you and give the other one a compliment that is timely, i.e. it is something from now, the last five minutes, is genuine, you have to really mean it, and it has to be irrelevant for what you do right now. Um, so I'll give you about a minute for that. I'll just stand here, I'll wait. Go and give each other a compliment. <laughs> Okay, okay, let's bring it back, bring it back, come on, come on, come on. Finish up your compliments, you've done enough, you're good, you did well, I like your hair. All right, come on, come on, come on, bring it back to me. Because actually learning, actually learning to give and receive compliments, while it does take a little bit of practice, it's kind of easy to do, right? It is something you don't need to go to uni for, for a couple of years. You can try this, you can learn this. Um, and by doing so, you will learn what others think of you. Remember, imposter syndrome, something with the internal measuring stick that's broken. So if you give a compliment, you will give to the other one your perspective so that they'll learn to recalibrate their measuring stick. Receiving a compliment works the same way. If you get feedback from someone, Yup, your hair looks really good today. And I go, oh, I thought it was shit, but I like that you like it. Thank you. So it kind of recalibrates your uh, measuring stick. So what you can do is take note of those compliments you receive, and it you know, doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be an actual compliment. It can be a small praise someone gave you. It can be uh, the accomplishment that went well, right? So after this, I'm gonna write down, you did a presentation at DevOps days, and it uh, didn't really suck. Thank you. <laughs> and so, but actually recording, remembering, writing down the accomplishments, and then looking at them when you're drunk, really helps. It really actually helps. It's a stupid thing to do, but I actually have a little book at home near my couch where I, you know, sometimes I write shit down. And the funniest ones are the compliments my kids give me because I'm training my kids to give compliments and receiving them and stuff like that. But, you know, my kids will go, you tied your own shoelaces. Yeah, I know, I can do that. But my kid gives me a perspective because tying their shoelaces is an actual thing, an accomplishment, for them, that's their perspective. And then I go, yeah, no, I've learned that 30 years ago. Thank you. But still, it reminds me of the fact that a kid has a different perspective. So that really helps. 
So go home today, create a brag file, uh, get drunk, look at it. I highly recommend it. <laughs> and then the, the compliment thing we did. Here's another one. Who knows this TED talk? <laughs> People that aren't raising their hands, go and watch this as soon as possible. I think this is one of the funniest and one of the most relevant talks on TED I have ever watched. Uh, even more funny than uh, the Mike Cannon Brooks one. Because what this basically says is you have a monkey in your head and you have a rational decision maker in your head. So my instant gratification monkey at about 11 p.m. last night said, wine. <laughs> and then my rational decision maker said, no, you have a presentation tomorrow Yup, that you need to finish and you need to prepare. And then the monkey went, yeah, no, but if I just don't do anything, I'll just drink wine now. And then if I fuck up tomorrow, then it's not my fault, but it's the wine's fault. <laughs> See how that works? So the, the monkey, the instant gratification monkey, kind of pushes you to um, delay, procrastinate, literally, so that if the thing you're gonna do, if the thing you have to do, like me presenting on stage, if that fails, it's not my fault, but it's someone else's fault, the wine's fault. Um, who, who knows the YouTube loophole where you go and sit down to do something, and then three hours later, you've watched all of YouTube? <laughs> I do that. Because that monkey is saying to you, no, no, but if you go and do YouTube now, then it's okay if you fuck up later because you haven't actually prepared and you didn't really have time to prefer, prepare because you watched all that YouTube. And then, you know, go around and around and around and you fuck up and you fuck up. Uh, I promise this is the worst joke I'm gonna make today. But uh, one other thing that really helps is to learn how someone else makes their sausage, uh, which is a good one because we have barbecue later. But the point is that if you learn from someone else, like firsthand, sit beside them, talk to them, how do you do shit? And then the other person tells me, yeah, I, I do it this way and I kind of suck at it, but it's still some, somewhat relevant and it kind of works out. And then again, you learn, ah, oh, people are just as fucked up as I am. Again, you're recalibrating your internal measuring stick. So in the DevOps community, you have all these, you know, ways of work, right? Pair programming, uh, peer review, I recommend pair review, by the way. Actually sitting down beside the other person and going, no, no, this line of code is shit, this line of code is shit, no, no. But actually, you know, sitting down beside them so that the, 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 uh, the person that actually created the code can explain, this is my thinking, this is my rationale, this is why I did it. And then the other person can go, oh, okay, I like your reasoning there. I, I spot a logic error there, um, and also, yeah, this or that or whatever. So again, because you're showing someone else your rationale, your you know, thought process, you help the other one to understand how another person works. I mean, how many people have actually worked together on a level where you can see how the other one works, like write code, write documentation, do whatever, do testing? I mean, I haven't. I certainly haven't. I'm, I've worked in a lot of teams. But teamwork is still, you know, you doing your thing on a the computer, then some, sometimes coordinating that, like meetings and, and stuff like that. But actually working together and actually sharing your thought process on how to do something, that's kind of rare. It doesn't really happen that often. So I recommend you do that. Your boss may not be happy with it, but uh, that's, uh, that's your problem. So other things you can do, celebrate your failures. Um, I celebrate my failures not as often as I would like. It's also because I don't really fail a lot because my procrastinator's brain kind of prevents me from failing. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a bad joke. Uh, but one thing that actually helps for me is, you know, talk about my shit. Um, I speak publicly here on stages like this, but also meetups, also in, in the companies I work for, I tend to share as much of the things I know uh, did or didn't do well. And it really helps. But that requires you to actually trust the other person. I mean, it has to start with the belief that you're not alone in this, right? Um, it has to start with you feeling comfortable to actually talk about it. But then trust the other person to, you know, they're human too, you can talk about that pretty easily. 
because it makes yourself at ease. It calibrates your ruler, it calibrates their ruler. It helps remove doubt on both sides. So, you know, do things where you talk about your things. I cannot put it more simple than that. Uh, but do public speaking, start small. Um, don't hide behind the curtains at social events. So don't leave at like six tonight because you're scared of talking to other people. We have whiskey upstairs if you're scared to talk to other people, you can borrow it. But don't hide behind the curtains. Participate, share your opinion, ask opinions of others. Make sure that you participate in conversation. And if you dare, don't talk about work. Don't talk about DevOps, don't talk about tooling, don't talk about CI, CD, it's boring stuff, right? I mean, we're not here at some DevOps conference, are we? So talk about your passions, talk about your interests, talk about, I don't know, your, uh, your bucket list, things you wanna do in life, things you did in life. I like stories about people who did crazy things. So talk about those, ask questions, ask for advice, i.e. show yourself. It's not that hard, right? It's easy. So for me, I also did a couple of other things. I started cooking and I started building quads or drones and then kind of crashing them into the wall. And I started over again, build a new quad, you know, fix it. And I had to wait a long time because all of the parts come from China. Um, so I took up a thing they call hobbies. I'm not sure if you know what those are. Um, but for me, hobbies are things that I can fuck up without anyone noticing, right? So I like building drones and then I like crashing them. Uh, but no one cares if I crash it or not. Right, so funny story, I actually crashed my drone again this week. Um, so I bought a new one, very small one, very light one. And then I flew it for about a minute and I lost it in a field where the grass is about this high. <laughs> so if you notice that I might be a little bit red, it's because I searched for two hours in the burning sun last week because I lost my drone. And so at some point I said, yeah, no, I'm not gonna spend any more time finding the drone. I'll just buy a new one. So I fucked up massively. I lost my drone, I cannot find it anymore. And I went, nah. And my wife said, oh, you lost your drone again? <laughs> <laughs> And she doesn't care. I mean, it's not her hobby, it's not her money. Uh, but I like, I like doing that. And I like actually fucking up my hobbies. I like uh, cooking as well. So I go to this cooking workshop every couple of months with a bunch of friends. And it's this beautiful kitchen where you know, 50 people at the same time can cook. It has all the appliances you need. Uh, there's a menu, you just have to cook. Um, but you have to cook for yourself and uh, you know, 15 other people that show up. And if we fuck up, if we you know, cook something that is absolutely horrible, uh, you know, burnt, no taste, slimy, whatever, we just go, ah, pizza, and we buy pizza. And that's fine because it's a hobby and it, I don't care if the food turns out great or not because I'm in it for the cooking, not the result. I don't care about the result. I kind of do, I like if it, if it succeeds, but I don't mind if I you know, don't get it up to a certain quality if I fuck up, whatever. So this has helped me uh, tremendously. So finding something where you can just do whatever because you like doing it without thinking about the end result. Because if you work, you get paid to do something, that doesn't really work that way, does it? It actually matters what you produce. It doesn't matter how you do it and it doesn't matter what you do specifically, it matters what comes out of it. The outcome is important. So that's kind of the, the stupid thing about work, I think, that it's results-based, usually. I mean, I give this talk, you don't mind how I give this talk, but you like if I you know, give you something in return if you like the presentation. I like it too, so that's why I do, I do it. But that's kind of the analogy, right? So it doesn't, in work, it doesn't matter how you do it, what you do specifically, it matters that you get the job done. In a hobby, it's the, the way, you know, completely, uh, completely turned upside down. And so I talked about an end boss, right? This was all the easy stuff. If you wanna discover why you have imposter syndrome, why you struggle with this, why you have self-doubt, you have to identify your limiting beliefs, i.e. you have stuff in your head that makes you think in a certain way, behave in a certain way, um, have an opinion about yourself. 
And so I mentioned the other two TED Talks, kind of forget those and go watch this first. This is a lady called Brene Brown. Uh, she talks a lot about vulnerability and shame, which is kind of hard for me to even pronounce, even on this stage. Talking about shame is something we, as a Western society, have great issues with. Talking about your own shame, i.e. your limiting beliefs in your head, is the reason you have imposter syndrome or suffer from symptoms of it. So go and watch this and learn how being vulnerable, talking about your own shame, helps you to actually overcome it. This for me is one of the you know, life-changing moments. I watched this uh, on a recommendation from my coach, my mentor, and she said, you go watch this, but make sure you're not alone and make sure there's people around you you trust. Because this had such an impact on me and she you know, figured that uh, and she, she uh, protected me from it. But this had such an impact on me as a person that you know, I wanna give back something to this community and say, go and watch this, make sure you're comfortable, make sure you have a nice beer or whatever you like to drink with you, uh, and make sure your partner is nearby. Uh, go and watch this, I really like, uh, I really recommend it. And so I think I'm done. Um, I would like to, to request one thing from you, so if you wanna give me a compliment after, remember? I'll be over there somewhere. Uh, if you can bring beer or whiskey or vodka or you know, I like all of those things. Come by uh, and give me, uh, give me a compliment. Uh, the links or at least the, uh, the references to the tech, tech talks are uh, up there. So take a picture, go and watch those. Uh, and for now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shib, for that talk. I'll start by giving a compliment. We greatly enjoyed your talk and it was very insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we have something for you. Ah, that's a compliment, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh. It's a compliment in, in, in the guise of a gift. <laughs>